<laughs> um, hey, folks. Welcome to the Wrench Turtles podcast, a show that's dedicated to helping mechanics improve their life, well-being, and productivity across the planet. And I say across the planet, literally. There is over 35 countries listening to the show on Spotify. Uh, it doesn't break that down on YouTube for me yet, but over 35 countries on Spotify. We've got almost 10,000 listens on Spotify, and we've got almost 100,000 views of content and clips on YouTube. So I really appreciate all of you that are listening. And those that are listening and watching today, you get to meet uh, I, the conversion here, we're going to have to work on this, and I think we're going to work on this in the show, but in England, it's AGV technician. So heavy goods vehicle, if I get it right, David, That's I think correct. I got it right. Yes. And he's also a content creator, so he's publishing content on TikTok and on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. So he's got uh, some really great videos, similar to uh, a couple of the other folks that we've had on. We had Mike Abel and we had uh, Rob Buttrick, who both are mechanics publishing lots of content uh, as mechanics on those different platforms, but they all have their own little inter individual style. And David, who is listed as Mechanic Mouse on, on his uh, social channels, you'll find that it's very intricate. And I really came across his content enjoying it because it's not detailed like you would expect uh, 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 somebody who's a super nerd like me would be explaining things in super detail. It's, it's perfect that anybody who's listening and watching can understand. So I really appreciated that. And that's why I reached out to him to try and get him on the show. So David, I really appreciate you taking the time and giving us a few minutes of your day. Brilliant. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. So, um, let's, let's roll right into this. So one of the things that is interesting across all of, all of the industries that I've had the opportunity to interview mechanics with is that we all have a slightly different way of getting into the trade and cross continent, cross country. It, it doesn't seem to change that much, even though there's only a couple different ways. It doesn't seem, seem to change. What got you into the trade? I think I sort of fell into the trade. That's almost, that sounds a bit cliche, but it almost chose me. I, as a young person sort of lost my way and went off rails a bit, um, sort of during high school and uh, late teens and unbeknown to me my nanny had already planted the seed many many years before that um, even at the age of three or four she was giving me hair dryers or old sewing machines um, decorating tables stuff like that just to take apart um, so I've been very hands-on always interested in knowing how things work what makes them tick. Um, so it sort of stems from there. But I started out as a mechanical engineer, mechanical electrical engineer, and done a level three at our local college um, in that. Then from there, I kind of, I was looking for a job for more money and fell into the automotive side of things. Mm -hmm. Found that I had you know, mechanical and electrical skills that I could transfer to pretty much any mechanical uh, background. Okay. Okay. You're, so that's, that's interesting. I don't think anybody's uh, described their nan as getting them in the trade. It's, it's typically mm -hmm. grandfather, father, brother, uncle, and, and whatnot. And it's usually because they were in the trade in some capacity or either in automotive or in the trade in some capacity, but you're that's so she was giving you stuff to fix yeah. or just to figure out, or was she just giving that is like re, on reflection now back? Is that a, this is broke, just give it to him to play with. And then all of a sudden you're tearing shit off apart. That's that. Yeah. I think that's more of what the case was, was, you know, just giving me something to keep me entertained. I don't know whether you'd class me as a child as having ADHD or just being a mischievous young lad, you know, but um, yeah, not very much of it would okay. have got put back together. Most of it was left in parts. <laughs> <laughs> um, typical. So I did that too. Yeah. Typical male, never finishing a job, you know, but yeah, there's so many jobs around this house that are, undone the adhd and the uh low time limits it's it, you get 90 percent, 95 percent of the way finish the job in the house and all of a sudden something else comes up like 
you know, the, the, the faucet starts to link and it uh, starts to leak and you got to fix that and you leave the job kind of undone. And then you go on to the next job because it's another fire as it were that you got to fix in the house and then another fire in the house that you got to fix. And then another fire. And then you've forgotten that six jobs ago, you hadn't finished the thing yet. You hadn't put the last 10 nails in or, or you hadn't secured or whatever the case would be. I, I, I get that. I the get that. It's hard, ends. man. Yes. The list never ends, and there always seems to be something on, you know, li- figurative fire, as it were. The figurative fire. Oh, this this is broken, or this is leaking, or oh, we need to do this, or, or we need to paint that, or we need to move. I mean, we got to move this. We got to move. I was like, oh my goodness, I just there's so many times, there's so many times where it's just, uh, I, I what can't can't now I just cherish the time. I just okay, I need to take time. Yeah, I need to go out in the motorcycle. I need a little bit of throttle therapy before I do the next thing. And then, and then we're good. So, okay. So she, your nan kind of got you in by, by giving you all the broken stuff to try and fix. And, and some of them didn't quite end up back together, but that said, you, you had said you had been mechanical, electrical engineering, and then you went to automotive. So what, yeah. what occurred in that first year? I'm assuming that you went into an automotive dealership an auto, like an independent service center of some kind. What, what was that first year like for you? Um, <laughs> Well, to be fair, so I had two years in what was a uh, woodworking factory and we were looking after all the machinery in there. So the CNC's, the laves, all them other bits and pieces. Um, Then on finishing or just about finishing my course, they weren't willing to give me a pay rise. Um, So unfortunately, I had to leave that job. And a friend of a friend had a job going with him and it was a a commercial body building company. Um, Mm -hmm. So I started there and that's when I then got into sort of the commercial side of things. So we were, I was specifically working and learning more to the point um, about hydraulic systems. But there was a massive part of that was fabricating okay. as well. So obviously we were, we were making these hydraulic systems, bin lifts and stuff like that from scratch. Um, okay, so just can I take a quick pause yeah. just to make sure that we're both on the same page? Because I know some I've heard it before, um, but I don't know if any of any of our North American friends may have understood it. When you say body bodybuilding, uh, commercial bodybuilding, you're talking about taking you know, cab chassis vehicles and upfitting them with beds and or uh, turning vehicles into cabs and things of that nature, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So building the bodies and whatnot on the back of the vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. I think over here more are, I think the language that we use over here is usually up, up upfit, an upfitter um, of some description. It's interesting how the language I can understand the bodybuilding because I, I noticed that makes a lot of sense. It's just not, wait, why is he talking about bodybuilding and then <laughs> hydraulics? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> cool. So you're, you're getting into that. What's, so what this is again. So this is interesting how this, this is progressing. So you're in an upfitter bodybuilding and where in the, did you, were you focusing on the automotive, like the small light duty stuff or, or were you almost immediately thrust into HGV in there? Most of the stuff there was heavy duty. Um, so you're talking from from us, anything over seven and a half ton gross vehicle weight is then classed as heavy. Um, most of the stuff I would say, you'd be looking at like a, a 19 ton chassis, gross vehicle weight. Um, mm-hmm. There was a few smaller things uh, like fitting out panel vans, um, stuff like that. But that was at that point. Where's I, the where's the dis, where's the dissemination between like? Uh, 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 now I don't know if how many. Well, I know you guys have the Toyota Hilux, and that is a truck. Yeah, that is automotive side. What is the dissemination between say like an automotive truck like that, and then? There's a limit to that. I don't know what that is. I'm assuming uh, assuming that's like two ton, give yeah, or take, two to three, three ton. Three to and then three you and said half, you've got a seven and a half ton. Yeah. So is that is that all? Is everything from like a Hilux all the way up to seven and a half ton? Is that just automotive to you guys? 
pretty much yeah pretty much as we'd almost class that as light commercial so your three and a half ton van weight limit for us mm -hmm. um before then having to have the special license to drive anything over three and a half tons so for us anything up to seven and a half ton i would class that as light anything over seven and a half ton i would then class as heavy okay Okay, so you sort of have cars. Does that mean Land Rovers? Does that mean Land Rovers <laughs> are classed as commercial? <laughs> if you, for us over here, if you've got a pickup truck like you like you say a Hilux, and that's pulling a trailer, uh -huh. if that's got a tow bar on it, it has to have uh -huh. a tachograph fitted because you could be potentially wow. over three and a half ton. If you're over three and a half ton, then that's, that falls into to, um, tachograph legislation as well. Wow. Yeah, because you th think perspectively, like you look at Dodge Ram 3500s, you look at, you know, anything 3500 or, or one ton truck as as it would typically be domestically called over here. Most of those trucks are, are three and a half ton, so to speak, themselves. Forget about putting a trailer on and putting something on the trailer and towing it because the... Um, if I'm not mistaken, I could get this wrong and get flamed in the comments. Um, but I think that the new Dodge Ram, the 24 with the, the Cummins in it and the dually will pull 35,000 pounds, which, which is what that's 10 tons. It'll pull or 10 or 10 to 15 tons. It'll pull on its own. Um, that's in what it's pulled. Forget about the truck itself. So that's, that's interesting. So, um, you go down as light as say, like a Toyota Tacoma, they'll still pull uh, five. Well, they'll probably pull two, three tons on their own, even as small as a Tacoma. Yeah. Right. They'll they'll pull two or three tons. So that's crazy to think that just your average average dude or 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 you know gardening woman going out to the garden center on a Saturday afternoon to get some some dirt in the back of the truck, they kind of need to have that sticker on them. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, but they done. They call it grandfather rights over here, and on our driving licenses, I can't remember what year it changed, but it used to be you'd be able to drive anything up to seven and a half ton on a normal driving license, but they changed it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they've changed it. So on on my normal driver's license, I'm only entitled to drive up to three and a half ton. Mm hmm. Okay. But, yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, it's quite funny. It's quite funny, really. Interesting. <clears throat> okay, so you're you're doing upfitting. Yep. Working on a lot of HDV stuff already. What was that like? Let's let's talk about the first couple of years of that. What was so, that like? For me, I'd I still haven't settled on where I'm going or what I'm going to do, or I've like got no career plan. I was a bit of a lost soul so to speak as a young lad and i think a lot of people out there are um and i'm just muddling my way through that's all i'm doing i'm just trying to earn some money muddle my way through no focus on really on education or getting a trade or trying to be the best at what i could be um yeah i am i'm just muddling my way through and that's how how i spent many years of my life in the trade um, but then where that started to change, my partner fell pregnant as in, as a person, you grow as a man a bit more then, don't you, once you've got a child on the way, mm -hmm. and you start thinking about the bigger pictures. Um, I found, yeah, I, I think lost is probably just the right thing to say. I think back then, looking at it, it's just lost, just sort of muddling my way through the trade, didn't know where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do. Did you have somebody in the shop that was kind of guiding you through that? A little bit. There's from my first mechanical course, um, I worked with an old boy, uh, you know, and this is the, these are the old boys that we look back on now and the trade is missing mm -hmm. because his knowledge about anything and everything mechanical 
was just way above and beyond. Um, there's things he's taught me that stick with me now that I still do now that I've taken and adapted to being an HGV mechanic or technician um, mm -hmm. that he taught me because he was an absolute legend in that respect, you know. Um, and again, the same at my, the next place uh, when we're working on the bodybuilding or the up, upfitting. Um, again, mm -hmm. there, there was a bloke there, you know, re really, really well qualified bloke, you know, couldn't have more courses under his belt if he tried, you know, hydraulics, welding, everything, mechanical, you know, he was there and that was him that opened my eyes to working on automotive more than anyone else because I was then coming in and getting driving license, get my first car and he's like, I'll bring your car around and I'll help you do your brakes and I'll show you this and I'll weld your sills up and, you know, just stuff that they needed for MOT. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I think that probably was my first point where I thought actually automotive that does lend itself to me quite well and vice versa. Okay. The, I, and that's one of the things that I am really trying to point out these days is how important those, not just, uh, a leader necessarily, but more importantly, somebody who is, who's mentoring guiding, coaching, that that middle manager position, that shop foreman, um, even if they aren't there in title, um, somebody who is guiding us through the trials and tribulations of what seems to be more than anything, um, becoming a man in the trade. And it's, it's not necessarily just becoming a man, but being a man in the trade, because you're to learn, there's so much that we need to learn, how we need to communicate socially, um, how do we communicate professionally? How do we communicate um, between teams, between leaders, between the people that you know sell the work that we do? Um, being able to communicate with the parts people to to understand, you know, how those relationships are built, and 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 on top of all of the technical stuff that they you know they've got 10, 15, 20 years in, and and we're just starting. You know, you get five years in, you're still a baby. Right. You, you still don't know shit from shit after five <laughs> years. And, and these people help us along and, and guide us along through the kind of make the better decisions and, you know, learn how to speak and, and things of that nature. It's so important to have those. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be a man that's guiding us because I'm sure that there are lots of uh, female shop foremen and female shop leaders out there that can do the same but I haven't met them yet and I would love to, to do so. Um, I've started to meet some and it's, I'm really happy to, to understand that the podcast has now given me an opportunity and a platform to talk to more people, especially women in the trade. Um, but the, the shared experiences, it doesn't matter whether it's men or women, we get the same shared experiences and it's those mentors that guide us through. So it's, it's awesome to hear that you had. So take us through, you know, what hap what's happened since then till now, because now you've been doing it for a while and now you are so proficient at it. You can talk eloquently. And as I said at the intro, uh, um, well, and simply so that anybody can understand that you're making content what happened between then and now, and what was the, the now thing that occurred that made you want to make content? Um, again, it's, uh, it's something I just stumbled on with a content um, creator. I just thought, I'll just give it a go. I'm just going to give it a go and just see, you know, I'd seen other people are doing it. And for me to do something like that, that's massively outside my comfort zone. Sitting here now talking to you, I'm mm -hmm. massively outside my comfort zone. You know, as mechanics, we're much happier with a hammer and a spanner in our hands. And we, you know, if you're working on an engine or... I'm in my element there that I know that's, that's what I know. Um, it took, as you said before, many, many, many years of experience and working through different independent garages, um, and working at one in particular, we used to do export of vehicles and that as well. So they would strip trucks and lorries down, containerize them and send them off to Malaysia or Africa where they would then rebuild them and, continue the life of the vehicle over there um but 
I like to try and keep things simple when I try to explain things to people at work. Um, I've done a lot of manufacturer training at a main dealers for the last six years now, and that's really brought me on to another level of being sort of diagnostics technician mm -hmm. um, and wanting to help people because I know how important that is to help people in the trade. You know, all the young lads that are coming through now, you see it time and time again, they get paired with the wrong mentor. The mentor might not be 100% interested. They might not be getting any extra pay so they don't want to do it or give it their all for whatever reason. Um, but anyone in the workshop, even our master tech, sometimes you need someone that you can talk to to bounce ideas off. Oh, I've tried this and I've tried this. I'm at a dead end. Have you seen any other faults with these? You know, things like you need someone to bounce off ideas sometimes. Um, and I'm very fortunate. My manager at my current job, he's a master tech himself. He's been in the trade all, all of his life as a mechanic. Um, and he's mm -hmm. really sort of guided me through this and he's played a ma major part in where I am now. But I do believe like you have to keep things simple when you're trying to explain stuff. You know, we'll all find our own way of doing something. And I'll, I'll, I'll quite often say that to a lot of people. It's whatever you find easiest. Mm -hmm. it's whatever you find easiest. This is the way I would do it. But you might find it easier to do it the other way around. You know, people Agreed. look at and things. That, that really resonates because the my, I use this phrase often and I try to use it and, and instill it in others as much as humanly possible. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Yes, correct. Period. 100%. That, yeah. Bar none, if, if, you can, if you can explain that to anyone and they learn that phrase and they start to use that in their day to day, when they realize that they're constantly tripping over their own words or they don't know what the right words are to say and so on and so forth, it means they actually don't understand the thing well enough. Because in order to understand something well enough to be able to explain it simply, you need to have multitudes of perspective on that one thing, right? You need to have lots of different perspectives on that one thing because when you have lots of perspective on one thing, you can attack it from 18 million different ways. It doesn't matter whether you're trying to teach visually, while you're trying to teach uh, audibly, whether it's tactile, it doesn't matter how you're trying to teach it. It doesn't matter who you're trying to teach it, whether it's somebody who's been in the trade for 20 years or, or 20 minutes, it doesn't matter. You understand it well enough that when they, when they do the, huh, you know exactly what to do now. You have another way that you can explain it or another way that you can ask questions or phrase it to them, right? Because you understand it well enough. And, it, and I'd like to highlight a little thing that you said in here. I've been at a truck ton of training by the dealer because it allows me to understand things a whole lot better. How many times do I have to say, folks, get your training exemplified here again? It doesn't matter what it is that you're working on. It doesn't matter planes, trains, automobiles, or HGV. Get your training done. So that makes me excited. That's awesome to hear. And it's awesome to hear that even now that you still have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of, because as we grow and as we learn, as, as we understand things better, we know that we still need to add perspectives to our own day. Like we've been through, you know, great, um, great apprentices that I've had in the past and great peers I've had in the past can go, I've done this, 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 and then this, these are the things that I've found. These are the things that I've found. I'm supposed to have an answer now and I don't. Can you help me now? And the ones that have done the effort, you know that they've put in the effort, they put in the time, the energy, and the thought to, to where they're at and they just don't know where to go. I'm happy to help at that point. But when somebody comes up to me, it's like, uh, what do I do next? Well, what have you done so far? Uh, that. It's like, oh my goodness. Like, what am I going to do with that? Like, seriously, why, why would I want to help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves? Right? Exactly. That's so. a big, that's a big phrase. Or like, if you're willing to help yourself, then I will help you. But if you're not willing to help yourself, then you're exactly. on your own. Yeah. So you stumbled into the content creation. Why did it, why? Okay. What, what 
what transpired you to tumble into being so completely out of your comfort zone that you're not fixing things, you're fixing things on camera? Again, I, I genuinely don't know. I just, yeah, it, you have, you know, you have these ideas, don't you? You just, <laughs> do you know what? I'm going to video that and I'm going to put it on TikTok or wherever. And yeah, it just started off and that's how it started. And then I've done a bit more and a bit more and some of the videos started taking off a little bit. And before I knew it, I was at that point where one of the lads' dads had seen it on TikTok and had recognised the workshop and said to... Because I hadn't told anyone. This was like, I kept it all to myself, you know. I'd, I try to be a doer and not a talker. So, like, I'll just do something and if it works, then I'll run with it. If it doesn't work, then you cut your losses, don't you? But and so one of the lads had seen it and I was actually off work for my two days off and everyone else was at work. So everyone had found out about it. So then I found myself in this situation. I'm thinking, right, now I need to talk to my manager about this uh -huh. because I need to make sure that he's okay with it. Um, yeah, and that just, yeah, before I know it, I'm talking to my manager and he's like proper old school as well. You know, he knows obviously about social uh -huh. media and stuff, but promoting companies and or yourself or that side of social, he doesn't use it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I found myself having the most awkward conversation with my manager regarding permissions and GDPR and all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, that just kind of run away with itself again. Like, I just I didn't want to say anything to anyone because one, you know what the banner in the workshop is like. Oh yeah, they're yes. going to tear me apart, and they have <laughs> te torn me apart <laughs> regularly. Um, and to be fair, a little nod to the other lads in the workshop, that's where the mouse comes from, the nickname comes from, because I'm the shortest person mm. in the workshop. So I am mouse. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. You know what? The hazing, the hazing happens. So as, as I've said in the past, if you're not getting hazing, if you're if hazing isn't happen or uh, or um, hardcore insulting isn't happening, they don't love you. Right. That's that is, right, yeah. that is there, there's a line in there. Now there is an obvious to many, there's an obvious line that you don't cross, right? There's an obvious line that you don't cross. But if your lads in the shop aren't pushing the boundaries of that line every single day, they don't trust you or they don't respect you or they don't value your insight or they don't value your input in any way, shape or form. And the challenge that we have as an older generation, not the old generation, because we're not quite there yet, but as the older <laughs> generation, yet. that's how we were taught. Like that's, that's normal for us. And I think many of us crave that, but at the same time, there is a different generation coming in that don't necessarily agree with how that rolls. So to be respectful of both sides of that coin I don't want to lose that camaraderie in the shop because I think it really does, you know, there's an aspect of that that is required for camaraderie because if you can't insult the crap out of your best mate on a daily basis and have that back and forth rapport, it means that you don't trust them. And whilst finding a different alternative to that, to, to instill trust in each other, uh, to make sure somebody's got your back. I don't necessarily know what that is, but I think we do need to explore how that works because we want to be inclusive. We don't necessarily want to lose ourselves and lose our values and lose our, our ethics and morals. But at the same time, if there's a way for us to be inclusive without be, without losing ourselves. Does that make sense? Perfectly, definitely. <clears throat> and I, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, there is boundaries and we do get very, very close to them boundaries and we do overstep them as well, you know, quite regularly. And I'm, I'll hold my hands up and I, I play a part in that as well. Um, a lot of the lads know in the workshop, if I'm quiet, leave me alone because that's mm -hmm. when I'm not going to play. Um, can be a little bit of a hothead sometimes. I think we all can to a certain extent, um, but we spend a lot of time with these guys. You know, I, I work 12 hour shifts. Um, five days a week, we spend half our life at work, you know, and I think that mm. is important that we, like you say, you do know where those boundaries lie with each other and the job's tough enough as it is, 
you know, you don't need to fight between each other. And there is always going to be that element or that one person that you don't see eye to eye with or you don't get on with, you know, but you don't have to go out of your way to make their life a misery. A hundred percent. You can not agree with somebody and still be civil. Exactly. A hundred percent. I think that's, that's one of the things that we may not have taught the next generation well enough is that you can disagree mm. or that you can not agree or however it, it, it broaches itself, but you can still be civilized and respectful. And I think that's perhaps the thing that social media has taken away from us to a certain degree. Now, obviously we've done it kind of to ourselves through that, but the unfilteredness there's a there's a, a level of respect that I believe that we should get everyone right off the rip, right? It's it's respect is to be lost. Um, I know a lot of people immediately saying you you have to earn my respect. Well, yes, but if you don't get if you don't dangle the worm so to speak, and that's the wrong really the wrong phrase because I don't mean it in that negative connotation. But if you don't give someone the opportunity. If you don't provide them enough respect or enough trust right off the rip, they're not going to do it either, right? If you give them nothing, why are they going to try? The, the opposite is true as well. If you give them too much, you're also going to get wrecked way more often than you are going to get you know, the same in return. So again, that, that balance. Yeah, I, I think there's, you've got your almost like your basic human rights, isn't there? You know, we're all humans. We all demand a certain level of respect. I do agree with that. Um, and I am one of them people that have been known to say it quite regularly. Normally, as you're looking up the ladder in the sort of path of command, um, mm -hmm. where I've said, you know, respect is earned. You'll earn my respect. We've had, I don't want to go into too much detail, but, you know, we've had people come in as workshop foremen who haven't really been up to the job um, technically or in a managerial um, aspect. Mm -hmm. And I've had conversations with managers and stuff where they've gone, well, how come you're not helping? And as my response has been, well, once they've shown me that they're, worthy of my that sounds wrong but once they've shown me they're they're capable of doing their job properly and i'm not the one that's got to keep bringing them up to speed all the time because i will i'll go out and I'll, I'll go out of my way to help anyone but there's a certain point where i go have to switch off and go hang on a minute i need to this is my job i'm here and this is their job they should be helping me not the other way around mm -hmm. so in in that respect i do feel that Yes, respect is earned, um, but as normal human beings, we do should demand a basic level of respect, you know, to your neighbours or to the little old lady down the street who struggling across the road, you know, just don't walk on by. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of that is lost in the generations now coming through. Um, I look I think at the, our the challenges apprentices and... I think the challenge is with the apprentices now, and I think anybody that's got less than 10 years under the belt, is that we, and I don't know, I don't know how to put my finger on it. I don't necessarily know that there is one thing that I could put my finger on, but at the same time, it's not an absence of our effort that has put them there. Right. We we as the older generation, we've been in it 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. We are influencing that to happen. We are allowing certain things to happen, so on and so forth. There's a generation of parenting that may or may not be successful. Um, there are all kinds of things that are contributing to people who act entitled um, there is now that's only a small portion of people. Of course, the people who act entitled are also usually the loudest people in the room, right? You can have one loud person in a room of a hundred and you're only going to hear that one voice. And then you immediately 
you know, the human brain almost immediately judges the rest of the room to be loud and obnoxious. Well, that's not the case. It's just the one voice that's loud and obnoxious. We have to remember there's a whole onslaught of people in the middle who just want to go to work and work hard and learn and grow and provide for their families. Um, it's, it's important that we remember that that is the case. And we can't paint everybody with the same brush. But to your point, when somebody comes into facility as a leader and you as somebody who is not leading is being asked to fill a, a large portion of what a leader is supposed to be, that's a problem, right? You're giving without, you know, you're not supposed to have the responsibility, but you're, it's being asked of you. You're not, you're being asked the responsibility, but not being compensated for it. Like these are the things Oops. there's, there's a line in that sand for entitlement. Like there's, if you're going to be given the responsibility and the, the requests pay for it and I'm happy to do it, whether that's in, in, in communication or dollars, it doesn't matter, but you got to pay for it. <laughs> Cut there. <clears throat> so that said, I think that's a, a, a good, good lead in here because I think with your experience now quite long on HGV and now that you've been making content, what's the most fun that you've had making content? Like what's, what's fun about making the content you do? That's a good question. I'll be honest, there's actually been a better response to people that I've met on social media doing the same thing or people just enjoying my videos. Um, there's been a lot of love come my way from that. And I would say even more so than from the people I work with, you know, um, they're all fine with it. And they ask how are you getting on with it? Now it's sort of died down, you know, the people I work with, that's now that's all sort of died down at work and they know it's just something that I do. Um, mm -hmm. They ask how I'm getting on with it and stuff, you know. Obviously, there's there's been a certain element of people that I work with that I've had to block from my social media mm -hmm. for certain reasons. Um, but they understand why because I've told them, you know, I've even blocked certain family members. I'm doing a live stream. I don't want family members coming on talking about personal things to me. I try and this, this business and personal life, I try to keep very separate. Um but yeah, the, the community out there, you mentioned Rob Buttrick earlier as well. Mm -hmm. um, I speak to him almost on a daily basis now. And there's various other um, creators out there as well. And there's just this lovely little community now that, it's, you know, it's really kind of cool to start out. to meet other, other creators, right? Because you, yeah. you get folks who are in the same boat where you're, you're working a full time gig in some capacity, but you're trying to do something whether you're trying to, to make a living doing it or whether it's just kind of something that you like doing as a hobby or you've got a purpose behind it, it, it doesn't matter. It's you're all making content and you're all working a full-time job and making content. We all share the, it's that same life that it's that same shared life experience, just like being a mechanic is right. You have the same trials and tribulations. Like you got to learn how to run technology in some capacity in order to make yeah. content, whether it's just doing it for, quote unquote, just doing it for TikTok or whether you do it for multiple platforms or whether you're trying to, whatever it is you're trying to do, you got to learn the technology, you got to learn the processes, you got to learn, you know, what works, what doesn't, you got to learn out, okay, what, what analytics should I actually look at to see whether this is performing well? Do I care about looking at analytics in any capacity, right? Get, getting away from the vanity, vanity met metrics and, and just doing something that you enjoy doing and then having a group of people that do it similarly to be able to talk. It's like, oh, you know, you see, you know, vidIQ came out with this new new thing as part of their their YouTube platform. It's like, oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, let's, let, let's go have a look at that. So th that I totally agree. Having that community around, yeah, it's good. like awesome. It's really awesome. So that leads us leads us to the last question. The the most important question that I've asked over the last two years is is after all of this time and all of your trials and tribulations of turning wrenches and having a partner and having children and working twelve hour days, five days a week on really heavy equipment, what's your one piece of advice to help a mechanic out there be happier? healthier, more productive. But you've got to look after 
number one, which is you at the end of the day. Um, doesn't matter how good of a mechanic you are. At the end of the day, you still go home, you're still a family man or you're still a partner to someone or a son to someone. Health and life is the most important thing. It's very, very easy to get wrapped up and lost in work. Um, but on the other hand, people use it as, as a coping mechanism as well. I find when I have troubles and personal troubles and stuff, I find work helps because it's my distraction, it's my release, it's my getaway. You know, if I'm angry, it doesn't matter if I chuck my spanner across the workshop because it's not going to hurt it as a piece of metal at the end of the day. You know, I can have that outlet there. And um, we live, we work to live, don't we? We don't live to work. Although I do think that being a mechanic is also a lifestyle as well. You know, there's always friends and family can you can you have a look at my car can you fix this for me you know oh can you get me some parts ordered you know it is a lifestyle being a mechanic definitely is a lifestyle i think the I big think one is you can... a couple of things in there you live to work i think as a mechanic we almost it's almost part of us that we live to work and it's really hard to get yeah. away from that because we use it as an escape as you say secondly you know through coaching a lot of us as mechanics doesn't matter the industry mechanics we we almost feel like it it's who we are right it it's it's who we are but it's not it's what we do and i think it's a challenge for many to step outside of that because as soon as you can step out of outside of that and realize that being a mechanic is what you do it's not who you are. It allows you to be free to do other things and be happy because we get so tied up in that moment. Well, when you, when you're able to step outside of that and you realize you can make mistakes and it doesn't go to your character, it goes to your education, right? One of those phrases is you, you, you don't rise. Uh, what is it? I can't remember what the rise part, but you fall to your highest level of training or highest level of process, right? When you fall, you fall to your highest level of training or process. It's nothing personal, has nothing to do with you personally. So when you can step outside of a mechanic being, it's not who I am, it's what I do. It allows you to make mistakes and not fall ill because of it. I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned through coaching just the hundreds of conversations I've had now, if we can step outside of that, if we can work to live and we can be a mechanic and it's what we do and not who we are, we can all be so much healthier, so much healthier. So I appreciate you sharing that. Oh, yeah, well, I agree. I agree. Um, you've got to do it with passion as well though, haven't you? To be, to be good at what you do, you need to be passionate about it. And that's, the one thing I always say, I get a lot of people on my live streams and stuff asking me, I'm, a, I'm an apprentice, what do you recommend, you know, any advice? And thus the advice is listen. And when you do a job, do it to the best of your abilities. You know, you've got to do mm -hmm. it passionately. If you're not passionate, you won't, you won't do it to 100% of your ability. Agreed. And that, that ties in with the do it right, do it once, doesn't it? You know? Mm-hmm. What is it, it? Do you have the same phrase we use it quite often over here? Is fixed first visit FFV? Is that the same concept? Yeah, we. It's not quite the same, um, and that varies between manufacturers and dealers and stuff. But yeah, fixed first time. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we don't. Yeah, do it right or don't do it at all. You know, that's how I look at it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, David, thank you very much for, for giving us some of your time today. I really appreciate it on a, on a weekend. I really appreciate that. How can folks find you? Um, so you can check out my link tree as Mechanic Mouse. Um, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok and YouTube as well. Uh, my main channel is TikTok, though, so that's, the others will follow, hopefully. Um, okay. 
I'll make sure to put links to uh, your TikTok channel at least. Um, if not the other ones that I can find, I'll get those in the description below. So if anybody wants to check it out and I, I am, I please check it out because one of the cool things that, that David does is when he does a repair and he's doing video about said repair or inspections or whatever, it's done methodically and it's done clearly and it's done simply. I know I've said that a whole bunch of times in this episode, but it's a really great way to show other mechanics how an MPI or a video, more specifically a video MPI could be done and it can be done simply, it can be done effectively and it can be done in a way that can convey what needs to be conveyed to a customer in a way that they can understand. And I understand that most of the stuff that David works on isn't necessarily going to be a customer. It's going to be a fleet or a corporation that's going to be looking at overviewing and so on and so forth. But the way he communicates would be like it's communicating to a customer. It's really awesome. It, it's it's in depth without being complicated. So I please check out his content because it'd be a great way to show all of your technician teams. Like, hey, this is something that you can add to your arsenal to doing inspections and video inspections to be able to deploy to customers. So please check it out, folks. And I think that's uh, that's the end of this episode uh, on a Sunday afternoon. I appreciate all of you tuning in and watching. I hope you enjoy and I hope you subscribe. Um, this is probably going to go out. Uh, um, just a bit after the recruiters series has just closed up. So remember to go check out. I think I've got, Oh, I can't remember how many I have now. It's seven or eight um, folks, recruiters um, in the automotive uh, slash Marine slash uh, industrial uh, commercial on-road off-road recruitment space. So that you understand what recruiting and mechanics looks like together. Um, and a quote to end the show as we always do which really uh, sings true to the whole episode now that we've, we've concluded. Be not simply good. Be good for something. Henry David Thoreau. So very specific, passionate. We have to be passionate in this industry to be great at mechanics. So remember, folks, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away. <laughs>